All right, so it's exactly three o'clock and the side event should start then. So my name, my name is Michael Kuhn, I'm a German citizen. I'm working as a senior policy advisor for the German NGO Welthungerhilfe on climate related issues and humanitarian advocacy. And I welcome you here in the room very much um, as well as those who are following us online to the side event on ecosystem-based adaptation and forest restoration for increased resilience. We want to talk about experiences from our EDQ, our Dominican Republic, where we are working with uh, vulnerable communities and critical ecosystems in order to make them more resilient in the face of climate change. And uh, we are, as Welthungerhilfe, inviting you together with Oro Verde, a sister organization based in Bonn, Germany as well and of course from the implementation partners in those three respective countries, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba. So the climate crisis threatens not only food security, but also animal and plant species. On the other hand, side, on the other side, nature conservation often also serves to protect the climate. The goal of the Paris Climate Agreement can only be achieved with intact ecosystems. That is very clear. Time to build bridges between climate protection and biodiversity. Only this can lead really to food and nutrition security. We think with the ecosystem-based approach, we contribute to the implementation of climate action as requested by the immense needs of the vulnerable communities. We and our local partners as implementers will deliver. That's sure as well. And we very much hope that the governments here at COP27 will deliver too. So I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker on this panel, which is Ms. Toa Loisa Lange. She is uh, representing the International Climate Initiative, ICI, of the German Ministry for Environment. So she's representing the German government here for us. And she is now giving us some introductory remarks on why the German government is interested in financing these kind of initiatives. So, Tor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to Welthunger Hilfe and Oro Verde for the nice invitation. I'm super happy to be today here with you and to learn more about uh, adaptation, ecosystem-based adaptation in the Caribbean. Um, this project is funded by ICI. ICI is the International Climate Initiative of the German government. And the idea of the ICI is to help countries to implement actions of the UNFCCC Convention and the Biodiversity Convention. Since 2008, we have been funding more than 800 projects worldwide with a funding of more than 5 billion euros. We have increased the funding in the last year. When we started on 2008, we, were, we had a funding of 120 million euros, and in 2021, we increased that funding to 600 million euros. So, and ICI has been, as an instrument from the German government, has been improving, growing, and we hope that getting better. Uh, for example, we're working on safeguards policies, social and environmental, gender policies, etc., to mainstream other topics besides climate and biodiversity conservation. So in the ICI, we have been working with climate and biodiversity conservation together for many years. And this is something that yesterday during the biodiversity day was very, um, we heard from a lot of political partners, NGOs and civil so society, the necessity to interlinkage both conventions because we can not only talk about climate change but also biodiversity. And in the German government, we talk about the third crisis, which is pollution, because we cannot forget about these three topics. And I'm very happy to be here today and to learn and get some in inspirations about these two nice projects and also get some lessons learned about how hands-on can, can, we can use that for future projects. 
So um, yesterday was a very special day for us today. The Egyptian presidency, along with IUCN, launched the initiative on nature-based solutions. And Germany is uh, supporting this initiative as a co-chair. And the, initi the NAC uh, initiative stands for Enhancing Nature-Based Solutions for an Accelerated Climate Transformation. And it, 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 I think it's a great day because what ICI has been doing in the ground, now we're going to coordinate better these efforts and bring it to the political agenda to enhance protection, to help countries to align better mitigation, adaptation, and to focus in a holistic way on topics like food security, adaptation, disaster risk reduction, oceans conservation and sustainable use, urban resilience, green and gray infrastructure, private investment, health. So the idea is really to try to learn from projects that are already doing some actions on the ground and see how can we scale up all this knowledge and, and brought it to other countries. Specifically, uh, talking about the Caribbean, we have 31 ongoing ICI projects and third, uh, three projects are in preparation, and all this funding is more than 400 euros. So uh, Caribbean is an important region, not only because of biodiversity reasons, but also because it's highly vulnerable to climate change. And I, I very much like this project because it brings not only the climate adaptation, but also bringing resilience to value chain, um, agriculture, landscape level, but I won't talk that much about the project because I, I think the, the colleagues can do it better than me. So thank you very much for being here. I'm very happy and I'm also very happy to keep learning from these two nice Iki projects. Thank you. Thank you, Tora, and yeah, thanks for the support, the institutional support we are receiving from you. So now I'm going to introduce you to somebody from the Caribbean. His name is Jose Gerhards. He's not here with us. So we are going to show you a video, but I would like to say just a few words on him because he's the secretary of the uh, Caribbean Biological Corridor Initiative in the Caribbean. So, and uh, that is an initiative of environmental ministries from five countries, Cuba, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and recently Jamaica. And it works thanks to the organization's support of the Regional Office of Latin America and the Caribbean of the UNEP program, the United Nations Environmental Program, and with the financial support of the European Union. Our project, the one we are going to present later, is associated with this initiative. But before we come to that, I would like to see us the video that we have brought where this initiative is presented. Today, I will present an overview of the importance of considering climate change for the effective conservation of biodiversity in the Great Antilles and to ensure the sustainability of livelihoods in the local communities of the Caribbean Biological Corridor. Even though the Caribbean islands comprise only 1.4% of planet lands, they boast an incredibly diverse and unique biota. 44% of plants and 35% of vertebrate species are endemic to the region. This high rate of endemism is the result of a highly fragmented geographic context. However, islands are also closely linked through the dispersal of nutrients, gametes, seeds, and larvae by winds and ocean currents, and by the periodic migration of insects, fish, sea turtles, birds, and marine mammals. These ecological processes ensure healthy and productive ecosystems with thriving biodiversity. They are the foundation of not only some of the Caribbean's main livelihoods, such as tourism and fishing, but also of vital ecosystem services as fresh water supply and coastal protection. The importance of the Caribbean biodiversity to the people of the region cannot be underestimated. Unfortunately, most, most of the Caribbean biodiversity is threatened by overexploitation, habitat loss, pollution, and many other human pressures. And while hurricanes and other extreme heat weather events have historically impacted the region, climate change is adding a new layer of stress as temperature warmer, sea level rises, 
the frequency of major hurricane increases and more extreme climate variability occurs, new negative impacts are affecting species, ecosystems, and people's livelihoods. In this context, the environmental authorities of Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Puerto Rico created the Caribbean Biological Corridor, a multinational initiative that have been working since 2007 for the conservation of biodiversity in the region. The CBC, as it is known for short, constitutes a regional biodiversity governance mechanism and a platform for South-South cooperation. For almost 15 years, we have worked to build a sustainable interaction between human society and nature in the Greater Antilles, while contributing to achieving nature conservation and sustainable development goals, not only in member countries, but also regionally and globally. The CVC focuses on maintaining the ecological connectivity and ensuring the persistence of a diversity of regional importance. But this is only possible when indicators of resilience and vulnerability to climate change are considered in the selection of thematic and geographic priorities. After a complex evaluation process, four groups of ecosystems and 14 groups of species were selected as CBC's conservation priority, many of them threatened by climate change in one or another way. To mainstream climate change into planning and practice, the most resilient, representative, and best connected ecosystems were identified and mapped. These areas were combined with priority species distribution and other maps of natural values to define the CVC spatial scope, including core conservation areas and zone of importance for connectivity. These spe space comprises the most resilient ecosystems and key sites for the most vulnerable species. Together, they provide key ecosystem services that support local communities' livelihoods. In addition, the CBC Long-Term Strategic Action Plan promotes and implements natural solutions for both people and biodiversity to mitigate and adapt to climate change. A sustainable future for the Caribbean communities will not be possible if we do not reverse the loss of biodiversity, rebuild ecological connectivity, adapt to climate change, and stop global warming together and holistically. Jose, uh, although he can't hear me, we would have loved to have him here with us, obviously, but um, due to the quotas we have as NGOs, you know, we, we cannot realize um, that um, everybody we would like to have here cannot really come here. Anyway, as we have heard already from Toa, yesterday was the Biodiversity Day. What today is today? Today is the Solutions Day, and that really matches with what we are going to present today because now we are entering into the little nitty-gritties of the project's realities. And I'm happy to present my, my friend and colleague, Johannes Horstmann from Oro Verde, who's here with us over there. He's the program manager and coordinator of the Oro Verde project team, supporting the project partners, in particular with the implementation of the EBA approach. And he's going to enlighten us, giving us an overview, introducing us to the project, explaining the approach, and um, for instance, referring to what is exactly an ecosystem approach, what is climate relevant about it, and, and what is the content of the project. So, Johannes, it's all yours here. Okay, uh, thank you, Michael. Um, merhaba, 
uh, welcome everybody here in the room and around the world. Welcome to everybody listening to us and following our presentation. Um, I will uh, take this opportunity to give a brief overview uh, about our project and some insights from implementation uh, of ecosystem-based adaptation. Um, so uh, we are now in the third year of an eight-year project financed uh, by Iki. Thank you. Um, um, so it, we are just uh, in the third year, and it still feels like we are we are about to start because uh, we had some troubles in the beginning due to COVID pandemics, um, which made it everything quite complicated in the beginning, but now at the end of the third year, we are already seeing uh, some first results. So here's the linkage to the previous video. Uh, our project areas are located along the CBC Caribbean Biological Corridor, uh, which was just in the video, and more precisely, we are located in the connectivity areas, which are uh, buffer zones around protected areas and remaining forests, which are uh, very important uh, for biodiversity, but also uh, for ecosystem service provisions. There is a high population density in many areas, and uh, many people depend on ecosystem services like water, for example, or other food products uh, that are coming um, from the ecosystem, from the forests, but even in agriculture, they are using soil and soil fertility. So the idea of the project is uh, that working with the population in, in this area, we can reduce the pressure on the protected areas. And that we contribute to biodiversity conservation, to the ecosystems, to maintain them functioning. And in, uh, in this logic, we, we also obtain then ecosystem services, which in turn are uh, to the benefit of the local population. Um, here with some more detail where the project areas are and the names of our project partners in Cuba, Haiti and Dominican Republic. Uh, greetings to you out there. <laughs> um, these are three different countries. Uh, as you may know and may have seen in the media, quite different culturally, um, economically, but also environmentally. Nevertheless, uh, they also have uh, something in common, which is uh, the climate change, uh, which is all over the wor world and causing already impacts here in the area, in the region. Um, so the idea of the project is to join uh, partners and to have a common objectives uh, to, to deliver on implement uh, adaptation to, to climate change following the EBA approach. So um, I have summarized here uh, our project objectives and I simply would like to highlight the key words that um, should be here exactly. We have to deliver uh, urgently with climate action and with action on the ground because livelihoods in these rural areas really depend on natural resources, on ecosystem services, and we know that these livelihoods are very fragile, very vulnerable, so it is very important to have impact on the ground. This is one of the very first, and. How we are going to do this is by EBA measures, uh, building pilot experiences, and then uh, promoting replication. And for this, uh, this project um, proposes a multi-actor partnership approach. So to bring together uh, the population of the same watershed valley, the population, the actor uh, stakeholder groups, um, fr from the region because actually they, they share uh, this, ch this challenge. This is the EBA approach. And then the third one is 
from our experiences, um, we we want to have incidents into into policies, into uh, adaptation plans, land use plans, and and uh, have an upscaling of the adaptation efforts that we are doing, because uh, we have to hurry up with adaptation to climate change as we realize. Uh, how uh, fast climate change is uh, coming across. Uh, next. Here we go. So uh, some insights on how we got started. Um, in the EBA approach, we follow uh, first a strategic analysis at a, at a landscape level, uh, including several watersheds. Uh, and the idea is to analyze the land use, the land use pattern, uh, where are the remaining forests, where are the water resources, where, where does the water come from, where is the population living. Um, and to uh, starting from this uh, initial situation then, uh, also add the information, what are local climate conditions and what are current trends. Uh, for the region, uh, what can we observe uh, from data, from information, but also um, um, what, um, what is the experience from the population on the ground facing climate change and uh, why, why do they do land use in the way they are doing it and what can we do about it in order to uh, increase the resilience of these people living in the area. Because what we observe is they are vulnerable to climate change impacts. They are having loss in, in harvests, for example, or uh, uh, when a hurricane is coming across, just, just to mention an example. So the initial uh, analysis phase, of course, was based also on a number of participatory workshops. And here is an insight of what we can find out if we look into the region, if we look into science and, and literature, and we see that there are trends going on. Uh, the precipitation pattern over the last 40 years, for example, shows some interesting differences. Not all our project regions are affected in the same way. And this is something we have to take into consideration when doing the planning of appropriate EBA measures. So just here, one brief example, and then the next is quite complex. Uh, all the information that is gathered will be put together in order to clearly understand uh, why is the population, why is the region vulnerable to those impacts from climate change that we are facing. So, uh, Julissa already made also this experience of building up this uh, impact change, uh, which is quite complex, but in the end it is really helpful also to identify what can we do about it. Where should we start to work? What are the most important steps to do in order to reduce vulnerabilities, in order to increase resilience? Uh, in the next years because climate change is coming and we have to be prepared as best as possible uh, uh, towards the future. So all the information from this initial analysis will then be put together in, in a new document which will be a planning of what are the most appropriate and most priority uh, activities that should be implemented systematically in a given area. This is uh, an EBA plan. plan. It is like a, a watershed management plan often, uh, but very important considering those climate change impacts. And what we, uh, what we are stressing also is to have a very participatory way of elaborating, of, of defining this EBA plan, involving stakeholder groups, authorities, and representatives uh, from the target population, so uh, farmers' cooperatives, for example. 
And then, um, of course, this is just another document, but what we really need as soon as possible is action on the ground. And uh, here we see some examples already from uh, measures being implemented in Haiti and uh, also in Cuba uh, in, in previous projects with a similar approach. Um, and in Dominican Republic, Julissa also has already earlier experiences in a, in a different watershed following the same approach. So that is uh, the most important thing about the EBA plan. It needs to be implemented on the ground. Then there's another aspect that I would like to highlight about, um, about the project. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, we are following the multi-actor partnership map approach. Uh, this is a way of organizing uh, the EBA governance, and this is a proposal how we think uh, we would like to involve the local population, the stakeholder groups, so that they are an, um, really active in decision-making about uh, the adaptation strategy which, uh, uh, which will apply for, for their region. So um, the idea is to form local committees, which are in a way um, steering groups, and, and their mission is um, to, to get together and to, to find out that there is a, a joint interest, a joint challenge, which could be called, let's win the race to resilience, ag uh, resilience climate resilience together, because everybody alone on its own uh, that will be uh, probably not work out well for everybody, at least. Uh, so this is the approach. And um, we are now in an in a early phase where these committees are being formed. They are being trained to understand what is their mission and how can they proceed on the ground uh, addressing um, uh, or involving the population and, and addressing the, the, the challenge of adaptation in, in their specific region. So on, on the left you see the examples of the committee and on the right here is another example from Dominican Republic where is like a future vision of what could be in the end um, the result of the, the MAP approach, multi-actor partnership. So it could be institutionalized so that after the end of the project there will be a, a structure, an organization which will continue to care about the adaptation uh, process in the region. Uh, the EBA plan will be existing uh, even beyond the end of the projects. And there need to be institutions responsible to follow up on it and to, uh, to continue the implementation and also the replication. There is a challenge with it, uh, how to finance all this, and, and this is where I just would like to hint that there are a lot of needs uh, for adaptation uh, finance. There is a big gap which needs to be closed, and this is something which hopefully uh, will be, uh, there will be progress on, on this issue here in Sharm el Sheikh in COP27. So um, some challenges from our, our um, implementation so far. We are dealing with extreme poverty and we really have an urgency of action on the ground because the environmental crisis in this country is not at all new. The population is widely impoverished and um, this is something we, which is part of the local reality. And when we start with a project and a planning and analysis project, this takes time, which maybe takes too much time and there might be uh, expectations for quick impacts. So um, what we propose is to have no regret solutions, uh, for example, setting up nurseries, which will later uh, help to do other reforestation efforts uh, and so on. So this is something uh, which uh, we realize and which I would, what I would like to share here. Another one is really a problem uh, limited availability of local climate data when we try to do the analysis fact-based and science-based 
for many regions, there are no um, measurements on, on climate data. Uh, so we have to derive them maybe from models, from satellite data and so on, but there's always a lack of precision. And then there's also uh, diverging perception. What we just showed on the map is maybe not what the farmer has realized during his lifetime. And he might have a different opinion and we have to ha have a closer look at this and, and integrate it. So that's also a challenge. We found a solution which I would like to share here, uh, which is climateinformation.org. You can have at least um, some um, information on future climate conditions for every single point on Earth. Of course, it's based on models, but it is something that uh, locally nobody could give you an answer. So this is really helpful. Um, what we also realized is EBA, ecosystem-based adaptation, has quite a specific terminology and logic. And it's not really easy uh, to understand it. Uh, we have realized it's not easy that among us, the, the project implementation partners, we are understanding the same thing when using certain words. And the same happens when the implementation partners talk to the uh, target groups on the ground. So we really need to do a special effort on interpretation of these terminologies so as to understand each other uh, what is the problem and what is the need and what, what is the proposal, what, what we are going to do. Um, this is tricky and something similar happened with the, the governance uh, approach uh, map. Uh, how do we communicate clearly what is the idea, what is the mission of the group which is being formed and how they should uh, proceed. We give some orientations from outside but uh, our implementation partners on the ground, they have to facilitate this process of, of getting the map process uh, started. And that's a challenge, definitely. So coming to lessons, um, I would like to share this one. Um, we, we might have a lot of knowledge, science-based knowledge internationally in the internet and everywhere, but it's not always available in the region. So. What we would like to summarize is this lesson to, to anchor the knowledge locally and to have experts on the ground from the population, professionals which are there and will continue to be there and to give them um, this capacity uh, and, and knowledge, uh, technical expertise about ecosystem-based adaptation. This is uh, something very crucial. The second is that um, we have to strengthen the organizational structures of, of the local uh, organizations on the ground, um, strengthen these organizational forms, um, and, and this will help them to organize and also uh, to, to be proactive after the end of the project. Um, Another one is peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning through exchange. What we have started already, uh, we, uh, to have uh, meetings and visits uh, among the implementation partners from one country to the other, which is uh, very surprising how many benefits there are from uh, traveling and learning how the, the partners are doing it, but to see it on the ground and the same applies for the beneficiaries to bring them into another region of their own country might be eye-opening for them uh, as they may have not had the opportunity even to travel within their own country. So this is something really valuable. Um, then, as already mentioned, and as part of the objectives actually of, of the project, we have to embed EBA into legal structures and, and instruments uh, which is really important uh, to have a continued adaptation process in, into the future and also beyond the limits of our project area. Um, and the last one, well, is a lesson uh, in a way about the governance mechanism and, and local involvement uh, uh, 
in, in decision-making processes, which is also very important. And as an example here, you see uh, one of our project areas where we have identified different levels and sizes of, of where EBA plans could, uh, could be elaborated and have their impacts on a, on a very community level or on a higher municipal level or even uh, connecting several municipalities uh, among each other, which uh, is definitely where we want to go and reach, but it's also uh, much more tricky for our implementation partners to, to organize um, uh, EBA plans at a, at a higher uh, administra administrative level. Okay, so coming to some recommendations um, to, to break down all that and uh, to leave a message here. Uh, the very first would be forests uh, need to be conserved where they are still there, existing forests. And this is really to be stressed. In a way, it is more important, uh, more efficient than uh, looking into reforestation and planting trees. I don't want to say that's not necessary, not at all. But it's so much more important, I think, to conserve the existing forest because any reforestation effort will not produce the same benefits that existing forests do produce presently already. So this is something to stress. We have to look into the threats of, of the existing forests and identify the appropriate strategies in every region and every country, how to uh, really um, uh, make sure that these existing forests will not be uh, uh, cut, deforested uh, in the coming years, because the frontier, as we could say, the agriculture is still advancing and advancing and advancing. We can observe it through satellite imagery, but we have to work on this tendency. We need strategies to avoid uh, deforestation. And then the second is um, ecosystem-based adaptation in agriculture has benefits for the ecosystems, biodiversity, for ecosystem services, and then also for food security, which is really important uh, uh, in these times and, and especially in these countries. Uh, where our project is being placed. So uh, agroforestry systems are one example uh, how to make this production systems of, of farmers more resilient to climate change compared to traditional agriculture farming uh, and open plots without permanent vegetation cover. Uh, and, and then there is a benefit to the, to the water in, in the area having forests, there will be more groundwater available, and this will also benefit then uh, the, the whole population and agriculture. So coming to an end, I just found this map, and it was uh, uh, surprising, so I wanted to take the opportunity to draw your attention to it. What happens if climate change continues and all glaciers in the world would melt down? This is a scenario w uh, which was... Uh, Elaborated here, sea level would rise by 70 meters, and where is Florida? And what happened to Cuba? Uh, we would have three islands in Cuba, and even Haiti would be separated into two. So the points that you see and the names are the cities which would be called Atlantis then, and completely underwater. And if you imagine... Uh, where would all these people go? We would have migrations, and we already see now uh, migration caused by climate change. So uh, this is something we have to work on, and this is why I'm coming to the, to the final message. Okay, here's a, a zoom in to, to our project countries. Uh, that was shocking, so I wanted to share it because I think uh, we have to, to work on mitigation, otherwise all adaptation efforts uh, might be insufficient uh, and shortfall um, mitigation emission reduction is key now uh, there are there are limits to adaptation uh, 
and we can put more and more money into adaptation efforts, but it will be useless in the long run uh, if we don't reduce emissions and, uh, and uh, slow down the global warming. So, and of course, after all, uh, we also need to increase efforts on, on adaptation. Uh, it will help in the, in the short and maybe uh, um, mid-term the to, to, to have more uh, stable livelihoods uh, for the population which is already now suffering from uh, the climate change impacts. So these are my final messages. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, we will have a question session later on, I think. We hope so, yes. If uh, time is uh, left over for questions and answers, then we will definitely do so. <laughs> Well, but thank you very much. I think that you touched the uh, important things, and I think that indirectly you touched loss and damage, which is one of the major topics here at the COP27, and, and the other word beyond adaptation. I think that is uh, something what we need to underline more and more, because indeed there are extreme events that lead us to situations where communities will not be able to adapt anymore, no matter how much money will be available for adaptation. But, but, we have heard now about the big lines of the project, so we looked a little bit of the kind of uh, macro meso perspective into the project, but now we are really going on the ground, and I'm very happy that we have Ulissa Alvarez here with us uh, from Centro Naturaleza. She is the project coordinator in the northwest region of the Dominican Republic, and she's an expert in watershed management, and she's now giving us insights um, from her daily work, so how what we say, EBA, ecosystem-based adaptation is translated into the real world of smallholder farmers. But before we start with that, we have another video, surprise, surprise, which kind of, um, I think is a nice, a nice entry into, into this. So please, the next video. Aquí lo más que afecta más a algunos tiempos es el clima, la seca, que hace, hace par de meses sin, sin llover y todo, y afecta la siembra y todo. Bueno, lo, más, lo que más me aterra, lo que más tengo miedo es eh, que hemos perdido muchísima cañada, muchísimos ríos se están perdiendo. Hemos perdido muchísimas especies de aves y y los mismos árboles que antes lo veíamos y ya no los vemos, los extrañamos. El cambio climático es uno de los problemas más graves que afectan las personas de esta zona porque afecta negativamente los cultivos y de los cultivos dependen las personas, es su medio de vida, su medio de subsistencia. Aquí estamos eh, aplicando unas medidas de conservación de suelo que se llama barreras vivas. La barrera la estamos eh, haciendo en virtud de que si no se hicieran, entonces nuestros productores perderían el suelo fértil, porque el, el, el arrastre que hacen las aguas es prácticamente el, el terreno fértil. Nos encontramos en la fase inicial del proyecto y hemos logrado implementar medidas relativas al sistemas silvopastoriles, sistemas agroforestales, huertas familiares. Próximamente estaremos también eh, mejorando estos sistemas y capacitando a las personas bajo el concepto de ABE. Pero una de las más importantes es la convivencia que hemos podido aprender con los bosques. Antes nosotros éramos enemigos de los bosques, eh, pero ahora hemos aprendido que con un buen manejo de los bosques y la reforestación podemos ayudar a que el medio ambiente sea más sano, el aire sea más puro, eh, la biodiversidad y el suelo sea más rico y por ende el suministro de alimentos más estable. Hello everyone. 
everyone. Um, in first place, thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this side event. I'm very happy to be here and sharing with you our experience, our ecosystem-based adaptation experience, experience on the ground, and I will show you some examples of this. As you could see in the video, we have no enough cover, uh, forest cover to keep flowing uh, the rivers. So um, this is a serious problem in the area because the people depend on this area, these trees, these ecosystems. And the project area is located in the northwest of uh, Dominican Republic. We are working with three municipalities, Villa Los Almacigos, Loma de Cabrera, and El Pino, as you can see clearer in this Dominican Republic map. This area is characteristic for uh, being uh, arid, um, semi-arid, and dry. On, uh, um, that means we have no enough precipitation in the year. And because uh, climate change impacts, for example, drought. And this um, situation affects the area, our sun. Um, um, what the farmer do? You can see this picture when the person is irrigating or watering his crop with the water from um, aqueduct from the communities, water supply for, of the communities. And this is um, a problem that we have. In the other hand, uh, we have floods, on the, but these floods, floods occur when uh, uh, extreme weather events uh, happen, for example. And as a result, the value, the value of the lands uh, is decreased. And this is our reality in the project area. We have soil erosion, extensive livestock, um, stock farming. This situation results in natural resource uh, effects on no water or no land to plant. These livelihoods are really, really damaged. But what is the technical response to face uh, climate change effects? There is EBA or ecosystem-based adaptation measures on the ground. We are implementing uh, agroforestry system, cocoa and coffee, for example, civil pastoral systems on uh, beekeeping. Uh, in the case of agroforestry system, cocoa and coffee, we um, have some of different crops uh, to be harvested from the same plot, um, soil and water uh, practices are also included in the agroforestry systems. Um, we have also family vegetables, gardens with uh, mainly with the women in, in, the, in this area and in our communities. This uh, kind of measure help to f the family because uh, it's a uh, chance or opportunity to have vegetables without chemical fertilizer. And the, the last one is reforestation. Um, the reforestation is for conserve and restore the 
forest ecosystems. Here, this uh, list of ecosystem services, um, not mentioned at all, but I want to say here that we have to maintain these um, ecosystem and services where we have them and to restore where these ecosystem services are totally diminished. In addition, we work also with a EBA governance from and for the communities. That uh, is um, a scheme where uh, all, all the sectors of the differ different levels are represented. And it's like a horizontal uh, relationship where all sectors have active participation in the decision making process. We have a uh, good experience from Conor Jacke, for example. It is an institution uh, with uh, members of uh, civil society, producers, universities, development institutions, among others, with the aim of promoting ecosystem-based adaptation measures to protect uh, the Mount River watershed. Uh, in conclusion, I want to say that uh, some points that I consider very important for, for us and for everyone. Uh, in first place, Eva approach co contribute or helps to um, conservation of natural resources, including actions to climate change adaptation. On the ground, on our communities, our producers depend on these resources to survive. They are protecting them on improving their quality of life to, uh, at the same time to get uh, food security and nutritional uh, security. Uh, for their families uh, in face of climate change effects. On the last but not least, um, increased knowledge about ecosystem services is very important for the people because we have um, the situation that the people does know what is going on or what uh, EBA means, for example, on this is an uh, important component, the building, um, capacity building, um, improve this component in the area. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you for giving us these insights from, from the ground. Very much appreciated. I think it was very clear that um, cheaper, it is cheaper for everybody to maintain what is there than starting to reconstruct, in particular if it comes to ecosystems. That, that is, I think, one of, one of the issues here. And I would like to, to share one experience when I was in March visiting the project area, which kind of made me realize again how important the work on the ground with the smallholder farmers is in order to make them understand what we are talking about. They understand often the problems, but, but the solutions is not necessarily what, what they have in mind because they use their soil for producing and selling. So one of, the, one of the farmers, for instance, said very clearly when he was told, for instance, between two manioc lines, have a little bit more of distance in order to put some grasses that protect the soil in addition to the manioc plants, he said, hmm, that means that at the end of the month I will have less money, or what? Be because my manioc harvest will be smaller. So then the technicians need to enter into a dialogue with this gentleman and to explain him that on the long run, the way they propose how to plant the manioc would be more favorable for him. And that takes time, that takes time, that takes, 
it is needed to build trust between the actors on the ground, you know, and it's, it's very sensitive. So I think that is something what we often do not realize when we talk politics and we say, we need more of that, we need more of this, and it has to have happen quick. On the ground, you realize that it needs time and you have to be patient and you have to have a participative approach and be in dialogue, not only with the communities, but of course as well with the local level of, of politics, of the governments, and last but not least as well on the national level. So that was just a small insight from, from me as I had visited the, the project in March, which was a very nice experience. But I would like to give you the chance, if you have any questions towards the project, that would be the moment. If that is not the case, because I can't mm, see any hand, um, we have with us as well Dr. Ulrike Kraus. She is um, responsible for the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund, which is as well an organization or a fund, as I said, that is uh, receiving financial support from the German government. They as well finance ecosystem-based approaches, uh, uh, adaptation projects. And um, I'm happy to have her here. Thanks for, thanks for joining us on the panel, Ulrike. And um, as a program manager, she's now giving us uh, an overview about what the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund is doing. And if I'm not mistaken, with a focus on Cuba and Haiti, right? Because now we had a focus on the Dominican Republic. So now we're looking at the other two countries. And at the end, she's going to make an announcement. So maybe you want to stay particular for that. I don't know, but that could be interesting. So Ulrike, please. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm actually in charge of the climate change program, which is just one of the um, three branches we have. The CBF Caribbean Biodiversity Fund just turned 10 years old. The oldest program is conservation finance. The numbers are mixed up on this slide. Started in 2012, then the climate change program in 2016, which is the program I'm in charge of, with the EBA facility being the only instrument that's really active. And the EBA facility itself is an icky project. And in September this year, we signed on another facility on circular economy. But I want to come straight to um, Cuba and Haiti. We have two projects in Cuba. One with the World Conservation Society in four protected areas. And you can see on this map how much it is spread with four Cuban and one US partner. And then a binational project with um, Cuba and the Dominican Republic implemented by the Ocean Foundation. Three sites in Cuba, four in the Dominican Republic. Again, a range of partners. And I'd like you to pay a little attention on the balance of local versus international partners because I come back to that later. And then in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, we have another binational project implemented by IDI. And the point here is to connect two national parks and protected areas in Monte Cristi El Moro in the Dominican Republic with the three bays national park in Haiti. And that really ties back to what Jose said earlier about the biological corridor, connectivity of ecosystems and the IDI project focuses mostly on policy and bilateral cooperation, which as you can imagine is very challenging with Haiti not really having a government right now. In Haiti we also have three national projects. One just finished after three years, JPHRO. The projects are located in the south, basically on the um, Tiburon Peninsula. Netherlands Red Cross has three sites there. Again, with multiple partnerships and the Pan American Development Foundation on Lagunaf Island with one Haitian partner, who I like to highlight, Poprobim, is a national environmental NGO that partners with all but one of our Haitian projects and are doing really a really fantastic job. Today is Solutions Day, so I was asked to talk about um, lessons we have learned. And the first I want to say is that at the CBF, we are lucky to have a lot of flexibility to whom we give our grants. Most of our money goes to NGOs, but we are allowed to finance government agencies, international academic bodies, even the private sector. And that has allowed us really to address the needs and 
also bringing the private sector to some extent that other agencies were not able to do. And in Cuba, because of the difficulty of moving assets into the country, we work with US registered NGOs and with UN agencies who have expertise, experience working with Cuba and how to deal with the um, OFAC regulations. In every presentation I've been to in this COP so far, the importance of support and buy-in of local communities was highlighted. And I want to go a little bit more into how are we doing this, what works in Cuba and in Haiti. And one thing that was highlighted by several of our grantees is the need for standardized socioeconomic baselines. Very often there are some baselines there and they are dug out from one or another shelf when a proposal is prepared. But you need the same methodology to speak the same language and compare different groups. So that was highlighted. And then you start engaging your community partners from the onset. So it is participatory planning. You engage them in as many activities as possible as you go along. And you have constant monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And the learning part is important because it feeds back and you learn from your mistakes, you adapt and you do things better because nothing goes really completely to plan in these countries. On the whole, we find EBA is a very effective approach to climate adaptation with sustainable livelihood and conservation components. So it is these three pillars that you see there in the um, famous IOCN graphic. And as Yulissa said, many people do not really understand that. And that is the first part in capacity building that we have to make people understand the three pillars that form EBA. The other thing we noticed, especially in Haiti and Cuba, we have to be very judicious about the use of external consultants. Often technology doesn't exist. We need external consultants, but not the fly in, fly out type. We have to tie them into capacity building at the local level and then build learning networks, like Ulyssa also said. Many people have never traveled in their own country, so enhance the peer-to-peer -peer learning. And from there, you build up inter-institutional, intersectoral alliances for true cooperation. Our grantees also noted that a bottom-up management worked best for protected areas. So the scaling goes from best practices to policy and regulation, not the other way around and from successful local government efforts to the national level, especially in Haiti, we can really only work with local government agencies because central government right now is very weak. In Cuba specifically, the collaboration between WCS and TOF is very, very valuable. They coordinate every visit when they travel to Cuba. They inform us, so we all met in Havana with the government of Cuba, then went together to the field sites. The Ocean Foundation also facilitated a workshop in the Dominican Republic, flew over the Cuban scientists, who were highly educated but did not have the technology to do sexual reproduction of Acropora corals. So they were trained and they went back and they managed in two national parks to get spawn and to get successful gamete fusion of the staghorn coral, which I understand is a very tricky one to work with. So this is a huge success. And we hope to follow up in February next year with the restoration workshop led by the CBF with the grantees on coral and mangrove restoration in the Dominican Republic. Cuba, of course, has special challenges with disbursements of funds, and equipment purchase, my first advice is consult a lawyer who specializes in OFAC matters. Otherwise, you can waste many years before you get a single dollar into the country. What works for us is to award subgrants to Cuban partners. Our grantees award subgrants as direct awards. If they have a partner and a mechanism that works, we don't ask that many questions as long as it's properly documented. And that has proven very valuable. And usually, the consultants and the um, grantees, when they travel, they have to carry a lot of equipment and cash because that is really the best way to get things into Cuba. 
Haiti has suffered an awful lot from all sorts of disasters, natural and otherwise, and that has strengthened their character and their resolve. So we can really turn that vice into virtue and facilitate to channel this into constructive uses. They're very strong people who really want to um, change things for the better. But we do have to prepare for high staff turnover because under those conditions, the highly educated young people, some fantastic doers and problem solvers, when they get a chance, they move on. And of course, we have currently extreme civil unrest, worse than it has been in many, many years. UN agencies have withdrawn all their non-essential staff. Netherland Red Cross wrote to us that they have suspended all activities in Haiti. So I got in touch with our smaller NGOs and they said, well, things haven't changed that much for us. The communities, rural communities, there are no gangs operating. They want to change for the better. So those smaller agencies, the small NGOs cope remarkably well. And they actually have something on their phone that they can real time monitor where the unrests and the roadblocks and the gangs are. So they avoid those areas. And their main bottleneck right now is the fuel shortage. So they have to stay very close which means four to five kilometers maybe to the field site so they can go there without fuel. Only our equipment is stuck in Port-au-Prince and we cannot get it um, out there. The community-driven approach has really helped us in Haiti to create community ownership and have successful implementation leading to what looks like it's going to be a very sustainable project. In just a year and a half, Pat has um, managed to facilitate a community-led coastal management and blue economy plan. They're now looking at um, blue carbon and train their own staff to widen that plan, and we're seeing first signs of behavioral change. Very interesting here is also the rich to reef approach because it integrates a wide range of stakeholders. And the same two-acre farmers in the lowlands, the flood-prone coastal areas, is a completely different stakeholder to a two-acre farmer high up in the watershed who has much more influence on what happens in the lower watershed, but less interest. Whereas the one at the bottom has a lot of interest because that farmer is affected by what happens and less influence. So you have to bring those two together that they see there is a feedback loop. And that again comes back to what I said earlier, we need standardized baseline methodology. On the whole, nature-based solutions are very well accepted because they're low cost, easily adopted, replicable, but we do have to do a climate risk and feasibility assessment in the beginning and select the most suitable species and approaches for each location and each partner. The local capacity building, I alluded to that earlier, we need external consultants, but make sure they leave capacity on the ground and then we move to um, networks especially in Haiti, because of the weak governance structure and because of a relative ease of getting funding for Haiti, there's some opportunistic bidders. And we found that the strong local NGOs that have a track record working with local communities and have their trust are best for biodiversity conservation and sustainable ecosystem management. And from them, with the building of capacity, we move to interinstitutional, intersectoral alliances and learning networks across the remote project sites in those relatively large islands. And very important here is that we speak the language of the people we want to reach. And for that reason, i like to share with you a video JPHRO produced. They hired one of the top animation artists in the country. Everybody likes animation. And that video is in Haitian Creole. It doesn't matter if you don't understand the language. I think it speaks for itself. It is now being played as a public service announcement all over the place and really has an impact. Ça a réglé ma grove, mais il y a des gens qui ont réglé le mang et des gens qui ont réglé le manglier. Mais plusieurs raisons qui font l'important pour nous protéger ma grove. Nous. Et c'est dans ma grove que les poissons sont reproduits. Donc, plus nous avons belle belles grove, plus nous avons des plus belles et des plus gros grains de poissons. Dès que nous avons des bons défenseurs qui campent red red devant la mer, 
pour empêcher le faire gol sous nous pour ne pas venir craser caille qui sous côte nous. Trois, mangrove c'est un bien naturel pour toute communauté a qui sous point pour disparaître. On plante des pieds bois dans tête mon nous pour qu'embêter a pour empêcher la boue descendre dans la mer à al détruire mangrove là. Pas couper le pour faire charbon. Au contraire, on plante plus mangrove. C'est un message JPHRO à Haïti vert sous financement CBF. Yeah, thank you. I like that video too. It's kind of funny and it reflects a little bit how life in Haiti can be if um, security would allow. So um, that is basically what we wanted to present in terms of the projects. I'm sure that everybody who's watching online has plenty of questions, but unfortunately only you here present can ask questions. So um, if there are any, please go ahead. We need to figure out, can you, the microphone eventually. Can you please then say your name and the organization you're representing? There's, there's a mic here. Would, you, would, that be, would that be okay to come up here? Hey. I'm Harold Beer from uh, now European Biotry Industry Consortium, <coughs> but I've been living there for quite a while. And my question would be um, how would you secure the, that what you transmit? there and the people you train stays and um, and will continue. Um, what you see a lot of times is that after the lifetime of the project, those groups just disappear because people have very important things to do, feeding their family, trying to bring them to school. And if you don't look at a value chain approach and an economic revenue, it, even those nice animation movies, they won't do a great job. Um, because people, they want to settle somewhere, mangroves are in the way, well, they actually are in the space where you could construct a house, so you cut them, make carbon, by charcoal, sell it, and then build your house. So, I've been working in different sectors now for like six, seven years, <coughs> and we've been working on carbon trading, so all those resources that are preserved they mean a lot for the whole world. They mean something for the people there, but in, in, the, in the situation where you don't have much choices, you will go for food, income, and a house where you can live. So I didn't see it now in the approaches that you kind of get people paid for something that they conserve, which is valuable to all of us. Is this a question specifically to Ulrike or to yeah, to me? <laughs> okay. Would you like to answer? Because the, he mentioned the mang mangroves, but I could also answer on that. Also for the, also for the All right. All right. Well, I can certainly answer what we, well, what JPHO did in our project. They had that same challenge. And I mean, the community engagement really means that the community understands very quickly. And that is not so hard to understand the importance of the mangroves there. But in the beginning, they had to, um, they called it payment for ecosystem services. I don't think in the classical sense it quite fits that definition. But basically, they paid farmers to plant moringa trees and more mangroves and to keep the rest of the mangroves standing until they had enough restored of the ecosystem. So the local community is 100% on board. The challenge now is more that other people who've not been part of that program come in and try to cut down those mangroves. So that leads to conflict, and that's again why we need to expand it. But I would say the, the project itself has left a sustainable change of behavior on the ground, but we have to work on a bigger scale to get the neighbors in and to make sure that those mangroves are protected. And luckily, the success organization of JPHO Core was successful under the third call for proposal and now have an eight times bigger project. So we are very hopeful that um, we can scale up that particular one. Yeah, Johannes, I mean, my, 
after he's after me, maybe he's going to respond. What, what I'm saying is that um, yes, you're totally right. Value chains are absolutely necessary. So they have to understand that what they produce, they can sell at markets, and and everything was related to that. But in the first place, I my, my my immediate answer would be: Isn't that a kind of government responsibility to protect the environment? It is. It is. It is as well. And I mean, there need to be structures in the ground. That's why we talk about local governance as well, and local and national governance, and good governance to ensure that these things are not happening so that there is a protection of the environment in a certain way. Like in the Dominican Republic, is it happening, for instance? I mean, they still have a forest coverage of 30-something percent, while Haiti has 2 point or 1.4 or something like that, because there's no government structure taking care. But, of course, together with the communities, because they live there and they live from what, what is uh, nature offering, basically. But, but I really think that it cannot be left to the communities only. So, but now, Johannes. Yeah, thank you uh, for your question also. Very interesting remark. Um, I would say, looking at Haiti and the mangroves, um, as, as Ulrika already mentioned also, but there is a direct benefit also for, for the population. And when we achieve to, to make them see it and to, to understand it, they would not ask for being paid for doing something for somebody else because they understand mangroves are the breeding grounds of the fishes that they will be fishing and later on be uh, cook for their children. So they can see this, when they can see this linkage, they, they will be in and they will be part of the, the project. And in a similar way, in our project, the idea with the agroforestry systems, for example, is also to improve household income and, and to have cash crops within the, the plot. And this will allow even rural families to have savings and, as you mentioned, to send their children to school or even send them to university and so on. And then, of course, there's always a risk that people having more resources and being trained, they are free to, to migrate and they, they could move away as soon as possible if once they have the money available. But when we manage to restore landscapes and 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 restore them and make them somehow uh, attractive, resilient uh, to climate change and attractive to live there, there will be opportunities for them. Uh, at least they, they, they might return or they would even prefer to stay because after all it's their home and they are not going somewhere because they don't like their home actually. They would move away for economic needs obviously. So this is how I think that the, the approaches that we presented contribute to the livelihoods and exactly are a way to make them stay in a way and to have a more functional local economy on the ground in Haiti and Dominican Republic and Cuba. I don't know if this answers your question in a way, I hope. <laughs> If you disagree, we could continue discussing, but maybe also if there are more questions, the floor is open, okay. You, you first and then next. Uh, okay, thank you. Thanks for your presentations. My name is Larry Paul Fuentes, and I want to ask my colleagues, Johannes and Julissa, about the, org the organization and the governance for the adaptation committees how it's structured, how it functions, how they are only doing the reforestation processes and taking care of the environment, or they also working with the value chains and support trading the products of the farmers. And also, another question is related to how do you explain, or because ecosystem-based adaptation is a term that very difficult to explain to, to farmers and to have it in the community, like with property. So how do you do a process about uh, having these complex words to the farmers and to the communities? Thank you. There was one more question somewhere here. Are you, you okay, you came. 
Okay, well, let's collect the question and we will answer on that. Sorry for having to pick up the mic. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for the panel discussion. I have a question on uh, success stories on receiving grants for these projects. So I used to work, I work now, my name's Olivia, I work at the World Economic Forum, but I spent some years working and living in Haiti and Dominican Republic. And it was really challenging getting grants directed towards organ local organizations run by locals. And there were a lot of challenges. One, the grant sizes were often way too large for that to even be absorbed in Haiti in particular. And then also just in general, the process was extremely burdensome and, and complicated and hard to trans, the process itself, hard to translate to, um, to the locals running those organizations. So it ended up being quite dependent on external people there, uh, you know, and trying to, um, to bridge that. But I was just wondering, I'd be interested across all these examples, how, um, how you've been able mm. to attract uh, grants to the projects. Thank you for that. Um, Johannes and Yulisa, can you try to be brief? Because now we are running a little bit out of time. But I really want you to answer the question. And then eventually, Toa and Ulrike for, for the second question. Um, well, I, I will try to answer the, qu the first question, which was on uh, EBA terminology and uh, the cash crops. No. Well, actually, as, as I'm working in Germany and uh, going to the regions from time to time, um, for, for the terminology, I, I'm in the discussion, and we are addressing this, this challenge with our partners first, um, understanding among us, the partners, the, the EBA concept and terminology, and then we see when we travel to the field, how they use different language and, and wording. And from the distance, it's very hard to help on this. We just can raise the issue and reflect on this and really uh, uh, ask in order to make sure, did they understand what you mean? And, and reflect on this. So this is what we do. And then Ulyssa might have more experiences from the on the ground. Um, how, and I have seen it, how we just have to change the wording. Instead of tr trees, they say sticks. And instead of clouds, they say snow or mist. So. There is a different language in the countryside, and this is something where we as Oro Verde build on the experience and knowledge that our local implementation partners have, because they are in the area, they are on the ground, they have their families there, and that's why we assume they are able to do the interpretation effort and to, to pass the message uh, to the beneficiary group. So uh, this is how I would put it. Maybe Yulisa can complement on this. Uh, I want to say that uh, I mentioned Conoriaque, right? Uh, it's a new institution. On uh, the institution have some um, organization from civil society, producers, universities, and they are working now in uh, uh, environmental education, for example, on uh, later they can work also with value change on other issues that care in this area. Okay, thank you. Um, for the second question, Ulrike, do you want to start? And then Toa, just two sentences, brief, please. Thank you. Your experience is exactly one motivation why the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund started the conservation finance project, and Haiti and the Dominican Republic have national conservation trust funds. The Haitian one is very incipient. They have not started giving grants yet. It is a process that takes many years. 
but that is a relatively unbureaucratic small grants program. There's also the GIF small grants program, they have an MOU with us. That is for the smaller organizations. Once they have two years of audited statement and experience, they can graduate and apply to the eBay facility. But as you saw, we, no, I haven't said that yet. So we start at $250,000 for up to two million. So you have to have some experience working those funds. And maybe just to add on that, I mean, uh, from the ICI perspective, we have different type of funding. So one size doesn't fit all. So you, can, you are more than welcome to check the ICI website. We have ICI medium grants, small grants, the theme call. We also are funding something like the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. And the idea is to try to approach, to have different approaches and, and to create capacity building because smaller organizations being part of a consortium, they can learn and they create capacities to also be able to manage funds. So ICI, 50% of the funding of ICI should go to at least 50% to local organizations. And this is something that we think is very positive so that we can create this scale of different sizes of organization working on the ground. Thank you very much. So before we wrap up, um, I hand over the microphone again to Ulrike, who wants to make an announcement, maybe into the direction of what the last question was, if I was rightly informed. Thank you very much, and we are very grateful to Welthunger Hilfe to have the opportunity to launch our fourth call for proposal here at COP27. So this is really wonderful. Just a couple of key facts. This moment now, the call is opening. It is a two-stage process. It is an open call for concept notes. And then the full proposals will be by invitation only of the successful concept notes. Eligible are Caribbean island states and territories that are on the OECD DAC list of ODA recipients. The exact countries are published on our website. I cannot mention them all. Regional projects can have some additional partners. And as I said earlier, we can fund quite a wide range of agencies. So do check out our website. And there will be a webinar for interested proponents on the 30th of November. The time at 10 Atlantic Standard Time needs to be confirmed. So um, again, keep your eyes on the website. And we can also have questions submitted in writing up to the 16th of December. That is for transparency. We have to publish questions and answers. So everybody has the same information, not just the ones who ask us. The EBA facility focuses strictly on coastal and marine ecosystems. The concept note submission deadline is the 24th of January, 2023. Maximum of seven pages in the template that we provide on the website. We do not want it to be modified, font size changed, margin chains and their like, because we expect to get around 100 submissions. And yes, the grant size ranges from 250,000 to 2 million. So we do not do small grants and there are some requirements in terms of audited statements. And co-finance is an evaluation criterion, but it is not compulsory for small NGOs. It is for private sector and UN agency. They actually have to provide matching funding. And the foreseen total value is we're aiming for 10 projects, high quality projects, totaling around 14 million US dollars. Quickly, the changes from previous calls for anybody especially online, who may have applied. Antigua and Barbuda is no longer on the ODA list. UN agencies will be limited to Haiti and Cuban projects only. For private sector and UN agencies, we expect matching funding 50-50, and we will be a lot stricter in the award of project preparation grants. And grantees must be able to open a separate bank account. We aimed for that before, but we got a lot of requests for exceptions. It hasn't worked for us very well, so we will not make exceptions. And we have revised our log frame, so if you're familiar with the old one, have a look at what it is now like, use our indicators. If not, just follow the instructions. And with that, I thank Welthungerhilfe, our donors, and of course the Strong Island 
network who brought us here. Thank you. So there was a good opportunity um, for you to understand where to apply for. So, I mean, I, I'm supposed to kind of come up with a summary, which I will not do, but I would like simply to say a couple of words, although they, they, they seem to me like a no-brainer, to be honest, because it's so evident. I mean, food and nutrition security is uh, the main pillar of the work of organizations like Oro Verde and, and Welthungerhilfe. And, and it is so clear that we need a functioning nature that can deliver what we need for life, right? So it's clear that we have to protect it, not to exploit and not to destroy it. But we need good local governance, as I said before. We need good and fair burden sharing as well if it comes to finances, for instance, and that's why finance is, is an issue here. Finance adaptation is an issue here at the COP27. We need, in order to allow adaptation to function, we need to speed up implementation of effective climate change measures mitigation measures in particular, reduce emissions at all sectors, or if it's energy, traffic, agriculture, or others, that, that is very clear, it's a priority. And we need commitment and financial resources to scale up ecosystem-based adaptation projects to assure life and dignity for those most vulnerable and marginalized dealing with the impacts of climate change that they haven't produced. So we know as well that there's a limit of adaptation. No? Uh, we had this map of the sea level rise. Mangroves will probably totally disappear with all catastrophic consequences for smallholder fishers and coastal residents. Or with chronic and long-lasting droughts, for instance, smallholder farmers will lose their livelihoods and they will be forced to migrate. Well, it's unfortunate that this is what we are talking about, but I think we have presented some ideas for solutions. There are others. These are not the only ones. So I think the combination makes, makes it right. But having said that, I wish you a nice afternoon. I thank you for your interest. I thank you here on the panel for your participation. And I thank the technicians here with their support. Let's work on that together because we are on this together and we must deliver now. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye.